So today we're going to be talking about adaptive gardening. Um, and in, in, in essence, there are two types of uh, ways that we can go about this here. Um, so in, in terms of the therapeutic value that you get from being outside, um, actually the webinar that we had a few weeks ago uh, really covered this pretty well in terms of the, the benefits of just us being outside. Uh, and this has been studied for a long time. Uh, actually, Dr. Benjamin Rush, he's one of the, one of the first ones, he's kind of called the father of American psychiatry. And um, he documented some of the first positive effects of working in the outside. Now we know that this is pretty common sense. Uh, we know that we feel better when we work outside. We, it's a rewarding experience. Um, uh, and, but through scientific study, and especially in the last couple decades, they have really been able to record physical reactions in the human body and the benefits of being outside. Now, yes, while we all might know in our brain, this is good for us to actually have that scientific evidence behind all of those statements is very powerful. And so the field of, uh, you know, having a, the therapeutic value of, of nature being outside, uh, it's growing. I know there's papers published in this every single week, it seems like. So this is a huge growing field. Uh, and this has evolved into something known as horticultural therapy or uh, therapeutic type horticulture. Um, and this is a area of study. This is a profession which you can become certified or licensed in. Uh, and you can become a horticultural therapist. Um, and so you can utilize being out in the garden to uh, help those either with some type of a developmental disability, uh, some type of a, an injury sustained, and, and then some type of therapy then for uh, rehabilitation. Uh, so there's a lot of different aspects of that. Now, I am not trained in that field. Uh, as Andrew said, uh, I'm really just a landscaper. Um, and so in my background, having had to memorize and learn a lot of what's within the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and making sure that any landscapes I designed that were for public use follow those rules. Uh, so, you know, I'll be leaning on that quite a bit today, but really what we're gonna be talking a lot about is that social horticulture side. So the benefits of being outdoors in the garden, that social side, um, gardening with others, gardening as a team or with a partner, I'll be covering a lot of that and the benefits of uh, just being out in the garden. And so whether you, no matter what color your thumb is, whether you have a green thumb or a you know, black thumb, however you want to go about it, um, this really is some, a, a program designed for folks to help adapt their garden, uh, whether they might have some type of, a, a, could be a physical disability, could just be what we all go through, getting older. Um, and so making sure that we are uh, just going to give some tips today to help us out in that regard. And as I mentioned, there are definitely benefits out there for gardening. We have the nutrition, grow your own vegetables. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, the, the reward, I think also uh, the emotional well-being of growing your own vegetables, eating healthy food. You just feel better at the end of the day. Uh, it's good exercise. Uh, and I don't know about you. But after a day of working out in the garden, working outside, I sleep pretty good that night. Uh, so it can definitely help us when our head hits the pillow to fall asleep. And that there is, again, that emotional well-being, that satisfaction or that reward of growing something for yourself, whether it was food or whether it was something that was showy, ornamental, bringing something of beauty into your yard and enjoying it. It's just that feeling of mastery of uh, of something. And gardening, this is one of the most popular uh, kind of, kind of, we call it hobby, recreational devices in the world. So a lot of people work out in the garden, they play out in the garden, uh, they enjoy the garden. And so this is something that brings a lot of benefit to us. And it just helps us with our mood. And it gets us out and talking with our neighbors. Maybe you are part of a volunteer group, master gardeners, master naturalists, a local garden club. It gets you involved with your community. And I would say, if I could just harp on this one, one more second here, being involved in some type of group and sharing that knowledge with others is so valuable, if anything, to share it with a younger generation to help bring that knowledge back up 
um, and to keep that going. Because if there's one thing that a lot of horticulturists uh, around the world are saying is that we are losing a lot of that knowledge. And so making sure that we keep that spark of nature alive in our youngest generation so that we can, um, you know, hopefully bridge that gap and keep gardening going into the future because why would we waste time and money saving and protecting something as the environment if our if our kids didn't interact with it and care about it so it's important just check in the comments real quick i can't see the comments while i'm talking so i just had to open it up here but now i'm closing it so uh, if you do have questions throughout the uh presentation andrew's going to cover those at the end um but i will be i'll just keep on going here uh so i apologize apologize if i don't see it right away so ways to adapt our garden and this is probably one of the most obvious ways so i mean this is the one that i usually turn to uh, first and, and a lot of what I do. Um, I've, I've built a lot of raised beds in my life um, and I think it's incredibly rewarding. It, it creates a fairly, fairly protect, productive garden um, and there's lots of different ways that we can go about this. So pictured on the screen right here, this is a raised bed built out of just, it's really just cheap pine. Um, if you want to go the route of say a cedar type bed or treated if, if that's if that's what you're comfortable doing that's fine but you know for my money I just buy the cheap uh, pine I know it's going to rot uh, in you know let's say five to ten years uh, but that's fine I'll just replace those boards when that happens um, and in terms of the amount of raised beds that you build it's going to determine what type of budget you are facing uh, I but if you want something that's a little bit more permanent you know there's always of course stone uh, where I went to school out in Manhattan, Kansas, we literally had stone just lying around everywhere. So there was no trees, but there was plenty of stone out there to build with. Um, brick, and uh, in my neck of the woods right now in Macomb, actually, uh, one of the main building materials is brick because uh, our nearby town of Colchester, they're actually historically known as a, uh, a supplier of brick uh, building material, which they don't do anymore, but they have, you know, it's kind of that, that uh, style of design in my neck of the woods. Or really uh, just heading out to either a garden center, construction uh, center, big box building center. You can get any manner of concrete block. You can get decorative concrete block. You can get the, you know, what they call the cinder blocks and uh, just build your garden like that. Now, as you are designing this, I would really, really emphasize that you can go as long as you really want in terms of the length of that bed. But in terms of the width, highly recommend no wider than four feet. And that might be shorter or, or not as wide, depending upon uh, your own ability. So I know with four feet, I can reach from one side to the other side. I'm not going to be tempted to walk around inside that bed or get tripped up or have to hop over them to the other side of the bed to do something. So I can reach into that bed on all different sides. So uh, I know that these are, uh, in terms of the dimension here, I can go as long as I want but I make sure to keep that less than four foot wide because that's more for my own ability and being able to reach into the center of that bed. Uh, so this is our uh, gift garden in uh, McComb, Illinois. And the gift garden stands for Growing Illinois Food Together. Uh, so we actually have some students from Western Illinois University. Uh, this was back in 2016 or 2017. Uh, they were helping us build our garden that first year. Uh, this is where our master gardeners, they grow food and vegetables uh, to help feed uh, and supply our local food pantries. And we are utilizing raised beds in this area. Now, um, we were going about this in a couple different ways. We were thinking about, one, we were going to have students out here, not only college age students, but little students, you know, uh, so K through 12 and thinking more on the K side of that, the kindergarten side. So do one of the items here is making sure that we had beds that were elevated enough so that they wouldn't walk in them and trample the vegetables, but also easy for them to access and, and pick, uh, say, fruits and vegetables or plant something out into the garden beds. Uh, the other thing is uh, just with ease for us adult gardeners, uh, having not have to bend over all the way to the ground is, is pretty nice, even though there's still some bending at the hip, I would say for many of us here, or bending at the knees. And really, whether you bend at the hip, knees, back, however it goes, I mean, it's all up to an individual basis. Um, uh, you know, having consulting with some type of uh, 
physical therapists, occupational therapists on best ways for you to uh, interact with your garden beds, uh, what joints to uh, put most of your weight on and things like that. I highly recommend that since I don't have that, uh, I, I don't have that knowledge base in order to, to be able to recommend that. But I uh, just know from personal experience, working with those therapists and uh, having them show you good ways for bending over and reaching down is very useful. Now, the other, I'd say maybe one of the main reasons why we have raised beds here is that when we selected the site for our garden, uh, we dug down with our shovel and guess what we found? Gravel. This was an old gravel driveway. Uh, we hadn't realized it at the moment, um, but you know we didn't get too far along before we knew that we had to do something different here. And so the raised beds have been incredibly useful. Uh, so these are constructed out of two by tens. Uh, so they're, you know, they're still pretty tall and we have been working. We actually have expanded this garden even further um, uh, outside of this, this photo where it, would, where it would be located now. And those beds are much higher. Those are actually one by 12 and we use cedar boards for that. Um, and then we've even talked of adding an additional row or a course of boards on top of these to make them even taller. Now, when we fill these up, you can see the students here, they are mixing it with a uh, mixture of 50-50. So 50 parts compost, 50 part, parts topsoil. Um, and so they uh, would wheelbarrow those in there, mix them up with the tiller, and uh, we would rake them off, level them, and that's when we would begin our planting. And there's other, there's many different types of raised beds. So what we were looking at there earlier was uh, like a low raised bed. It's lower down, you know, towards the ground, towards, you know, probably knee height or lower. There are a few other types of raised beds out there. Um, and the one that I really like working in is the elevated bed. Now pictured here on the right side of the screen, there's actually the two types of bed. Elevated bed, there's on the kind of that middle uh, part of the screen and then on the right side of the screen we have these deep raised beds and so these are raised beds that are built with one two three uh, courses of lumber uh, and so these are probably about thigh high for me uh, so we're talking about two and a half feet maybe um, and this is just incredibly wonderful to work in because there's just a little bit of stooping you know to like bend over a little bit and, and grab a few things uh, but there's no kneeling, there's no bending over at the, at the waist, and so it's pretty nice. Um, I, I really like the elevated bed because I can get up close, I can put my feet underneath there, and I can work uh, in that bed, and I, I don't feel strained at all, except for maybe after a while the sun beating on the back of your neck, um, you know, gets a little hot and, and such, but I really love working in the elevated bed. Now, something to know about working with elevated beds uh, I had mentioned with the raised beds, uh, we're doing 50-50 compost topsoil. With the elevated bed, as you can see, it's being supported by four, uh, four by four posts. We have to watch our weight limit on there. And so actually we are swapping out the topsoil for potting soil. So we're mixing in 50-50 compost and potting soil. That's much lighter weight. It facilitates better drainage because really what are we doing here in this elevated bed? We're creating a giant container that we're growing in. And so as we are uh, growing in these containers uh, and oh, oh, and also with the deep raised bed, that's uh, typically still used with like a 50-50 mix compost topsoil. Now, uh, wanna make sure folks are really tempted to put a lot of filler there in the bottom and that's fine. It does kind of depend on the crop that you're growing, um, you know, but I know uh, working with another group here in Macomb, you know, they're talking about putting in, um, I think it was like milk jugs and uh, things like that in the bottom. You know, I, again, that's okay. Uh, I think they were just growing some annual uh, flowering plants in there because it was for the front of the building. Uh, but if you're going to be utilizing like some deep rooted plants uh, or perennials. Like I know a lot of folks like to go strawberries in places and those deep beds right there. Uh, it's really a good idea to maximize the amount of soil volume that you can there and put all of that in that topsoil and compost mixture. I know that's going to be expensive. I know that's gonna be a lot more work, um, but it is definitely useful for those plants to have a higher volume of soil. They can be healthier, uh, they can just perform better in that regard. 
Now, I, in, in my life of renting homes and things like that, I have turned a lot to container gardening. I really love container gardening. Uh, it's actually how I gardened last year, uh, even with our, you know, our new home that we bought. So um, container gardening, whether you're growing ornamentals or uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, it is incredibly, it, I think it simplifies the process that you don't have to till anything up. You don't have to do anything like that. Uh, you grab your potting mix, you fill up your container and you plant your plants. The biggest thing you have to do is make sure that you keep them watered. And in our hot Illinois summers, that definitely can be an issue, especially when we get up in the nineties and it's windy and we got to water those things maybe once or twice a day. Uh, but I util utilize containers a lot in my own garden. And with these, we are using a soilless potting mix. And that is uh, for, for many reasons. One primarily is uh, for the plant, health of the plant. We're talking about good drainage. We wanna make sure that water is draining away from those plant roots so that the plant's not sitting in water. Now, the other thing is it makes the container very lightweight. I, I don't know about you, but I move my containers around quite a bit. Maybe I need to move something here or there. Uh, and having a lightweight container is definitely easier on my back. And so that's why I highly recommend using a soil free uh, potting soil mix. Uh, don't be tricked when you go into the store and you buy uh, some of these things that it says potting soil on it. Um, and you go to pick it up and it's so heavy, it's, it's incredibly heavy. The soilless or the soil free potting mixes, these feel impossibly lightweight. You know, you pick up a big old uh, you know, four cubic foot bundle of it. And it's, you know, it's heavy, but it's not nearly as heavy as say uh, four cubic feet of actual soil would be. So use that soil free mix. And I have utilized a lot in these last few years, fabric containers, uh, especially uh, not pictured here. Actually, there is one uh, fall. So there's a ground cherry in that first uh, fabric container. And then I think there's a pepper and then a tomato following that. The pepper and the tomato containers actually have handles on them. And that is amazing to be able to move these around the garden with. Um, so I have utilized fabric containers quite a bit. They are a breeze. When you are done with them at the end of the year, I actually just kind of invert them. I fold them uh, inside out. I dump all of the potting mix out in the compost pile uh, and they just, smashed together. <laughs> it's just amazing to store those. Uh, you know, they, I can fit like, uh, you know, 20 on the shelf in the garage with no problem at all. Uh, so yes, utilizing fabric containers quite a bit. So if you are a container gardener, you move them around quite a bit. Uh, this is pretty nice. I will say fabric being highly porous, more porous even than clay containers, these are going to be um, drying out fairly quickly. So this is something that you do have to keep on top of the water. So you don't wanna be putting these out away from any type of water source. We're gonna to have to be hauling buckets of water because I know uh, if you're like me, I would definitely uh, not do that in the middle of summer. I will stick in the shade. Now there is a lot of talk about straw bale gardening. Um, you know, I, I feel straw bale gardening, it, it, it provides an, some additional layer of work, um, but it is kind of that instant raised bed the additional work is kind of, you really do need a dedicated irrigation system for this, and you need to provide that supplemental nutrition, that fertilizer, uh, because there's not much nutrition in that straw bale uh, at first, definitely. You know, you have to let it break down, let it compost a little bit, and then you have to, again, make sure that it's watered very well. And we have probably one of our most popular videos on our YouTube channel, the same channel this video is going to be posted on, uh, is at University of Illinois Extension Horticulture. Kelly also gives a great uh, uh, webinar on how to grow in straw bales. So if you are interested in that, check out that video. Um, go ahead and subscribe to that channel and you'll see this recording pop up there in a few weeks. Now, when we look at how we get around the garden. Now, obviously concrete is ideal, but that is a lot of money. Uh, pictured on the left side of the screen is actually a stamped concrete. So it's fairly decorative. It's, it's very pleasing and fun to look at. Uh, but yeah, it is the more expensive option out there. Now, if we're talking about kind of middle of the road, flagstone probably is going to be uh, better. But flagstone, as you can see, this uh, stone in the middle here, it's actually set in mortar. Uh, this is to help prevent any type of any of the stones from tipping or coming up and creating tripping hazards. Um, so you do have to make sure you watch out with that with flagstone. 
Same thing with brick pavers. Now, brick pavers are kind of everywhere. You can go to almost any store now and just buy a pallet of uh, brick pavers, whether it's made out of you know clay or fired clay or whether it's made out of concrete. Um, so these are incredibly popular these days. Uh, the brick pavers and the flagstone, you know, this is pretty much something any homeowner they, they kind of make it so that any homeowner can install this. The concrete definitely uh, has a much steeper learning curve in doing that. So you really have to hire that out. Um, but brick pavers are, are fairly accessible, at least for homeowner installation wise. Um, but when we're looking at surfaces that are easy to navigate, you know, hardscape surfaces like these are, are kind of the ideal thing to be utilizing. But let's look at a couple others that maybe not as expensive. Um, and uh, but maybe don't provide as much stability. And the next one is gravel. Now, I think a lot of us probably have gravel walkways that is just it's dirt. And then on top of that, you have a gravel. Uh, pictured here is actually these little structural cells. These are plastic. You put them on top of, say, a prepared compacted base material. And then over top of that, you just rake or sweep in your gravel material. And this creates a very stable surface. This creates a very stable surface uh, that you're able to walk on. Wheelchairs can go over, uh, roll over this fairly simply. Uh, they even make these so that um, this is where, say, if you're in a park setting and you see, well, they drove that food truck over the, the uh, that gravel there and it went over with no problem. Well, that's probably because they have some type of a structural cell underneath that gravel like this. They even make these for lawns so that you can have these lawns uh, that grow in these little plugs, but are actually strong enough to support something like a fire truck. Now I'd say one of the things that I found in a lot of residential landscapes, maybe more of the higher end residential landscapes is to decompose granite. Now this is it's kind of a more expensive material, but really this is any kind of like stone fines, rock fines, brick chips, anything like that. Uh, that's just smaller particle size. Now the nice thing about decomposed granite uh, or any type of uh, gravel fines or material is that it compacts pretty nicely. It packs down and it creates a nice, even surface for uh, walking or wheelchair use. And so, yeah, th that's just what's pictured here. I really like this. The other thing that comes with both gravel and this material is the sound. Now, you know, we kind of think back to that, that therapeutic value of nature, just hearing that sound of those footprints, uh, footsteps on that gravel pathway. We don't think about it maybe actively, but it is doing something, it's moving something in our brain. We hear that sound, we hear the wind, we hear the wildlife around us. Uh, it's all interconnected together. So uh, also just thinking about kind of that, that auditory, that sound interaction that is occurring here. Now, probably the thing that is most accessible to all of us is going to be something like uh, wood chips. Uh, so you know, arborist wood chips, they're typically free for a lot of people in the, in the uh, United States because arborist, uh, you know, uh, electric companies, uh, landscapers, they're looking for places to offload a lot of their wood chips. You know, they cut down trees or they trim trees and they have these trimmings that they need to offload. Um, so you can usually get these uh, either delivered for a fee or for free. A lot of municipal landscape uh, yard waste facilities actually will let you just drive your truck up. And if you've got a shovel, you can load your truck with as much wood chips as you can. Um, now, I would say wood chips, if they're a little bit more difficult to push a wheelchair over um, or any, if, you, if you have like a motorized uh, uh, wheelchair, anything like that, it, it's a, I think it's a little bit more difficult. But if you are walking um, on, your, on your feet and legs, I feel like it cushions that a little bit more. It can be a little bit more comfortable if you're going to be standing on that for a while or walking on that for a while. So there's definitely some cushion that, that is created here uh, when utilizing some type of wood chips. Uh, you can put them on pretty thick in pathways, you know, four to six inches deep. Uh, typically, when you're in the garden bed, though, we're recommending around two to four inches deep. And you can always get creative. Uh, I stand there and I see the cashiers at a, at a checkout working the cash register and you see those rubber mats they stand on. You know, that's for, because they're going to be standing there for hours and that's for comfort level on their joints so that, 
You know, if you have, say, a potting bench or something where you're going to be standing and working at, you could get something like that. Pictured on the left side of the screen is actually those uh, rubber mats that they use uh, in horse barns for horses to stand on. If you have any carpet scraps or remnants uh, that can even uh, be used in garden pathways. And so there's, there's ways to be creative in order to create a, a more stable walking surface or an area where you'll be working. Now, there are some materials that I would steer you away from. And the first would be pea gravel um, and, and then sand. So pea gravel, unlike what we talked about with the, uh, the stone finds or the, the, the gravel itself, um, pea gravel has a rounded shape. The other gravel has a flat or an angular shape. That flat and angular shape means that it's going to lock together more tightly if you've ever walked on pea gravel, I mean, that's why they use it a lot in playgrounds. It's because it doesn't lock together. It creates a cushion so that when a kid falls, uh, then it, it, it absorbs some of that impact on the ground there. So this is not an easy surface to walk on. It's not an easy surface at all to push a wheelchair on. Same thing goes for sand. Sand moves. It doesn't necessarily lock together, so uh, it's not compactable. So, you know, in terms of these two materials, I would try to steer you away from something like that if you're looking at a walking surface. Another thing to avoid is your pathway route. I know we love bends and curves and it looks so natural and flowy and organic, but it can also become excessive. And then imagine you're trying to navigate this and say I may be a walker or a wheelchair or something like that. Oh, it just gets annoying. And so our walkways, yes, we should incorporate more curves, more gentle edges, if that's your, uh, if that's the style that you're going for. But watch out for some of these just excessive amounts of curves and bumps and pathways. It's just, we, it can be overdone, so it looks bad from a design standpoint, and then from a navigation standpoint, it also can become difficult. I do recommend, though, um, you know, if you're going to do some type of uh, an edging material. It should uh, be brighter, it should highlight that edging material. I can't uh, tell you, or I, I don't even know. I mean, several times I have tripped over plastic edging, metal edging, um, you know, edging that's just kind of barely hiding there and sticking up. What you see here is some type of, a, it's a concrete edging uh, piece and it's, it's painted bright white. It's visible. So not only can we see it during the day, but it really pops in the nighttime. Uh, so this is just the stable edge, making sure that we are calling attention to uh, that there is a transition between the turf grass and the planting bed and don't trip right here. The other thing that's highly recommended is when you transition from two different walking surfaces. So uh, yes, we walk on lawns and we walk on this little front entryway right here, but we have to, we, we really should be um, signifying this transition from one surface to another. And that's where this edging material comes in. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's bright, it, it's colorful, it, it pops. It's even though, again, it's not maybe not a conscious thought for us, our brain is seeing that and it is indicating to our brain something is changing. So prepare yourself. So going from this brick walking surface, surface and say you hop over onto the lawn there, that edging right there along that paved surface is signifying that there is a change in texture happening here is a change in walking surface. Now, yes, this is done for stability and for, for uh, navigation. It's also a very good design technique to have some type of an edging material around your paving area. One more thing that, uh, you know, as we look at modifying our garden a little bit is looking at what type of spigots do we have there? I know most of us, I'd say almost every home uh, residential uh, spigot that I see is that rounded valve that you have to turn that wheel to, to open it up. That gets, I would say, when either you're very, very young or very older, or maybe say you have issues with arthritis in your hands, or your hands are full with other materials, those rounded uh, spigot valves are very hard to turn, especially if you're wearing gloves and they, maybe they got some mud or they're a little bit uh, not, they don't grip very well. Uh, so for, uh, in terms of like ADA accessibility, you know, we really do wanna uh, try to replace a lot of those rounded spigots with lever type uh, spigot valves. So on the left side, you know, just a simple 
uh, you know, simple lever right there, or there's that uh, type of farm hydrant lever there on the right side of the screen. So something that you can pull up or something that you can twist uh, with your fingers. And, you know, if we could help to avoid bending over to weed the garden, that would be ideal. So mulch helps us to suppress those weeds. Again, I mentioned two to four inches deep. Uh, from a horticultural standpoint, I would recommend using an organic-based mulch, so something that would break down over time and add organic matter to the soil you know, that would be useful to the plants. I know a lot of folks uh, like to use rock mulch. Uh, you know, rock doesn't break down necessarily very quickly. Uh, rock can also create a more inhospitable environment for plants by keeping the area artificially hot at nighttime. And um, this, depending on your source of your stone that you're using, it can impact soil pH slightly. Um, so again, if I could recommend you or steer you in a direction, it would be the organic base type mulches that break down. Yes, we do have to reapply those every year, every two years. And so, yes, that does become additional work. Um, but, you know, I, just because I was trained in horticulture, it's hard for me to say, yes, please put rocks around your plants because they don't necessarily thrive in those conditions. Um, ground covers are a good alternative to mulches. And actually, you know, if you start with wood mulches and then you plant some ground covers and you can transition from, uh, you know, having to install wood mulch to now the area has some type of ground covers. And pictured here, uh, I believe that's a type of vinca uh, that's uh, trailing underneath this tree right here. It's spread, it's filled in those areas. If there is a few weeds that poke through, they're easy to see, easy to identify spot and pull them out. Um, maybe you don't utilize one mass single species of ground cover like pictured here. Maybe your ground cover is mass plantings of other types of perennials and, and things like that. So it doesn't all just have to be vinca. Uh, actually, I like to incorporate other perennials and kind of plant big blocks of them and kind of that new perennial uh, garden theory design style and plant big blocks of those and then they allow those to suppress the weeds with their canopies every single year. We love water. I mean, whether the most interesting, interesting things to watch, I think, are fire and water. So it holds our attention. So garden ponds can definitely be a hazard for some. Uh, I would even say maybe all of us <laughs> have had a close encounter with a garden pond at, any, at some point in time. Uh, pictured on the left side of the screen is actually a garden pond. Uh, you can see though, look at the, I mean, in, from a design standpoint, it, uh, it looks really sharp and crisp uh, with the, the edge that just drops right into the, the pond right there. However, you know, if you do have maybe little ones, uh, other ones that might be in a wheelchair, anything like that, having a lip that could stop them from accidentally rolling into that uh, garden pond would definitely be recommended. So pictured here is actually the children's garden at the Chicago, uh, at Morton Arboretum. Uh, so you can see, I mean, it's just, it's just slight, but just a little lip that can prevent, say, if someone was in a wheelchair and maybe they weren't facing the pond, but they might be turning around, their back was to, and they're turning around in that wheelchair. The chair will hit that lip, will stop, hopefully stop that wheel from going over that lip and taking them in, with them into the pond. So uh, just having some type of little barrier there to stop some somebody from accidentally tumbling in. Um, you know, maybe a far better idea if, if space is an issue or if there is a real risk there is uh, still trying to enhance that, that backyard space or that, that gardening space with water, but just the sound of water. You know, a small little bubbler pond, uh, a little fountain uh, can give all the interest of water without the hassle of having to maintain a pond. So maybe consider something a little bit smaller and, and easier to maintain and manage. Um, now, I am not a natives only person. I like uh, my fair share of European, uh, Asian, African, Australian. Uh, I don't think there's any Antarctican, but uh, others plant species. And as so long as they're a, a not invasive species, um, uh, you know, they, they can be utilized in my landscape. But I do love native plants. I am working very hard to try to incorporate more native plants into my landscape. Now, native plants are often marketed as their lower maintenance. Yeah, they can be, 
Um, but guess what? They all plants, no matter where they come from, have to get established first. And that establishment period usually is the same amount of work, no matter what you're growing. Um, but typically native plants can be considered low maintenance once established. Now, uh, do you want a landscape that is free from insects and any, uh, anything happening like that? And then you plant milkweed and you realize, oh, everything's eating the milkweed. Well, that's a native plant that has interactions with other insect species that it's co-evolved with over millions of years. So that's gonna happen. Uh, so just know that when you plant native plants, you are creating a, a food web, an ecosystem in your yard. So, and you are plugging into that with your native plants. So, but the nice thing is that it, the native plants can be adapted to the extremes of our Midwestern climate. Uh, you know, we, we're 70 degrees today, but we're gonna get cold in the next coming days. And then, you know, but that's just typical for us. We go from extremes of uh, flooding to drought, uh, to freezing cold, to very warm. And our native plants have been here long before we were uh, and have developed adaptations to this weather. And I say tolerant of pests. Uh, it's not like they are immune to pests. They tolerate them because they've adapted to their feeding over the years. And so the pests feed on them. They, are, they have uh, mechanisms in their physiology to uh, ward off excessive feeding. Uh, but yes, can a tussock moth come in and strip away uh, your uh, Arkansas blue star? Sure can, happen to me. So uh, it happens, but that's okay. The, the Arkansas blue star, uh, which uh, Amsonia hubrechtii is a scientific name, it was just fine. It relieved out, it was just fine. Consider plants that trellis. So if we look back to the garden, um, pictured here on the left side of the screen, this is where we actually planted our cucumbers our first year in the gift garden in Macomb. Um, so we just have some cattle panels which are zip tied to some uh, fence posts. And uh, we have actually a little drip irrigation system that's on a timer. So these plants kind of took care of themselves. We didn't have to do much. All we had to do is come in and pick them whenever we saw a cucumber. So no bending over, very easy to uh, manage uh, during the hot uh, growing season. So something that, that trellises, uh, so very good. Also, if, if you have the ability to give some uh, something for, for children to walk under, and I'll even say as an adult, I like doing that still, um, give them some adventure. Uh, again, looking at that therapeutic value of nature, getting those kids interacting, get their imaginations going, get them passionate about nature and being outdoors, get them excited about it, they will learn about it, they will strive to uh, keep that flame going through their generation and protect the outdoors. So uh, left side of the screen, a typical like TP type structure uh, could be say a three sisters type garden on the right side of the screen. Uh, these is actually our bean plants at the McDonough office. Uh, again, cattle panels, uh, which are just uh, arched over and anchored down on the other side. So two growing beds, one cattle panel, uh, and bean pan plants, uh, pole beans growing on either side of that. Uh, just look at that color difference. Look how much shade is de there underneath that. It is actually really cool to walk in there. You're in this almost dark shady area and then you walk out the other side and it's bright sunshine. So, so neat. Um, and if you're working with kids at all, I, I would say this is almost a must. You know, and if you are new to gardening or you are working with others that are new to gardening or not very experienced, we do want to start with things that are going to be easy to grow. Again, that, re that feeling, that sense of reward when you grow your own food, you grow a, a, a beautiful flower, um, that's really useful to have uh, to build that confidence in gardening. Some easy vegetables and, and like turnips and radish, onions, potatoes, all these root crops, they're, they're simple to grow. But I think the fun part is like, it's like opening the present. Uh, you don't know what you have until you pull it out of the ground. And I think in terms of kids and adults, I think we like that. Um, you know, basil, you could take a cutting of basil, put it in a glass of water and it will grow. So that's a very simple plant to grow. It just has to have good sunlight. And, uh, you know, if it's not in a glass of water, it's in a pot, make sure you uh, are watering uh, on routinely. Um, not everyone is a fan of kale. But boy, I wish I had a kale farm when kale was booming a few years ago because it is so easy to grow, has like two or three pests that, that go after it. Uh, but otherwise, it's very simple and easy to grow. And there's a lot of different things you can do with kale. Dinosaur kale is probably one of the funnest things to grow, especially with kiddos. Um, 
in terms of flowers, you know, a lot of the annuals, sunflowers, marigold, zinnias, uh, pansies can be, I think they might be a little bit more difficult to start because you've got, that's not your typical starting time of year. Pansies are a cool season type flower. So you got to start them fairly earlier, um, earlier on. Uh, but then, you know, coneflower, uh, black eyed Susan, things like that. Uh, other perennials that you might be able to plant and see those plants established. And if you have a little bit more time uh, with your whatever audience that you might have or yourself to be able to see those plants establish and then thrive over a couple over a year or two. Then you can always bring that garden indoors. Um, probably one of my my favorite things is uh, going downstairs to the laundry room and seeing all of my indoor plants underneath the grow lights there. Um, it, it, this is very nice to have in the winter uh, to see green. Uh, so it gives me that boost that uh, kind of that I, my mood feels better uh, emotionally. I know that there's something to look forward to. So uh, bringing the garden indoors, having a little bit of green during our kind of during our, our white and snowy winters that we have. Uh, and try to avoid plants that have thorns or any type of prickles. Uh, uh, try to avoid plants that are toxic. Uh, and, you know, especially if you're going to be staging these in either a school or an area where the public might be coming through, touching them, uh, you never know. You know, some, someone might grab a leaf and stick it in their mouth. So uh, you just never know. So making sure that you're not putting plants that are toxic to people out. And, you know, there are just some fun indoor activities that you would do sitting down uh, at a table with some others. Uh, one of my favorite things is you can just take a couple sweet potatoes. Uh, you can cut them up or don't cut them up. Uh, some people just put them in like some wet sand in a Tupperware uh, container. That works. Here we actually took some skewers and we uh, skewered our sweet potatoes to get them to uh, initiate rooting and uh, sprouting some vegetative growth. And those are called sweet potato slips. You can pull those slips off the sweet potato in the spring and you can put those in the ground. But it's a fun indoor activity. It's something that you can do uh, in the winter months. Another thing you can do on the left side of the screen is actually propagate other plants. Uh, so we have these little propagation chambers. They got the clay pot in the middle that keeps that media moist because that, that moisture diffuses through that clay pot into that vermiculite in that larger pot. So pictured here, uh, the green uh, fleshy plants, that's, uh, that's actually pothos, I believe. And uh, so there's some pothos cuttings. Uh, and then also you could force indoor branches. So there's some forsythia right there. You can see that, that yellow bloom popping right there. Uh, so forcing some of our outdoor flowering shrubs. On the right side of the screen, you could investigate hydroponics. Put this on uh, you know, the counter. Uh, this is just a, a little plastic bin from a big box store. Uh, they cut out some holes in there. Uh, they put in a little uh, air stone in there to circulate some air, put in some, some plant nutrients, some special hydroponic type nutrients you can order online, uh, then put their plants in there. So, and, and if it fails, you still can say, hey, I did it. It was fun. I learned something. And, you know, maybe, maybe you'll try it again, or, or maybe, you know, you'll give it to your neighbor or give it to your friends. So, um, some other things to consider though, we talked about adapting the garden. Let's talk a bit about the gardener ourselves. So I have to remember to do this more um, and making sure that I am stretching. Um, things are popping that didn't used to pop and creaking that didn't used to creak. And, you know, so making sure that you're taking time before you get started to stretch uh, so that you your muscles and your joints aren't put into shock when you start digging that hole or whatever it is you're doing. Research does show that if you vary your activity about every 15 minutes, you should change things up. You can limit the amount of uh, injury that you might cause to muscles and joints. So if you are weeding, set a timer or something. If you have a washer that dings every 15 minutes, you know, set that and just say, all right, 15 minutes. Now I can uh, stand up from weeding. You know, maybe I'll rake a little bit or something. So vary that activity about every 15 minutes. And make sure, please drink plenty of water. Um, I don't know if, if uh, I know some of us drink plenty of water. I don't, I need to drink more water than I do. So making sure that we drink enough water um, because probably I would say one of the things that might hurt most at the end of the day uh, is, is when you get that headache because you know maybe you got uh, just too dehydrated and maybe you got 
too hot. So hot weather can definitely become an issue. Taking plenty of drinks, especially if you're working out in the heat of the summer. Uh, work in the morning or evening, you know, don't drink, you know, coffee, alcohol, tea, anything like that when you're out working. Uh, sunscreen is your friend. So please use sunscreen um, and, uh, you know, apply that often. You know, SPF of 30 is recommended. And keep in mind, I, I, I recall, uh, I think it was my sister, she got a sunburn on a cloudy day. Uh, that can happen because UV light still penetrates clouds. So make sure that we're putting on that sunscreen. And I have gotten into the habit, I used to wear a ball cap. These days I wear a, a much larger straw cap or hat and, um, you know, to protect, protect my ears and the back of my neck as well. So I highly recommend something like that. Garden gloves come in all shapes and sizes. Um, you know, I, garden gloves can be something that, it's not something that I always use, but after enough times of getting uh, wood chips, even occasional thing, a glass stuck underneath my fingernail, something that I prefer to use as much as possible. I really like the gloves on the left side. You know, they're, they're flexible, they're pretty lightweight, uh, but they do have kind of those rubberized tips and palms that protect my fingertips and my palms. You can go crazy though. They have these gloves that have claws that you can use to dig and stuff. So, you know, it's up to you, but I, I really just like something simple like pictured on the left side of the screen. And tools, holy cow, I wish my garden shed looked like that. <laughs> it looks amazing. Uh, the tools come in so many shapes and sizes. So, you know, make sure that we utilize them. You know, we have handles that are fiberglass and those are nice because they're lightweight. Um, they, they can snap though, but you really got to be moving like a boulder, I think, uh, to snap something like that, or, or they, and some of them do bend, and a lot of the cheap ones might, uh, might fall apart after a certain amount of time. Plastic, I mean, it, they make everything in plastic these days. Uh, these are really nice to have, especially when you're working with um, maybe some uh, audiences that can't lift up heavy tools, and so a lightweight plastic tool, something just that can be used to scratch around in the soil, dig things around. Those are really nice to have. Now, when we look at things like metal and steel, um, this is going to be stuff that's going to last the longest. This is going to be useful for you in um, making sure that this is a tool that is going to last kind of, you know, for your generation, the next generation, the generation after that, we have to take care of them. So there are methods to make sure that we clean these every single time we put them up, uh, but they're heavy. Uh, and so, you know, maybe there are some smaller tools and I'll just back up here real quick, like something like this, this the metal head on this is much smaller. It's, a, it's more lightweight. It's got the fiberglass handle, smaller head to it. So it's much easier to utilize. It's got the handle on the top. Uh, which can be useful for some. I would say, look at the kind of those shoulders at that metal head there. Uh, they're not very wide. I would say if you could get wide shoulders for standing on or you know pushing down into the soil, that's really useful because nothing is worse than you go to put your foot on that uh, shovel to push it in the ground, your foot slips and you maybe you cut your ankle or something on it. Uh, wood bamboo, um, the, you know, the, the bamboo rake, very lightweight, you know, easy to use, the uh, wooden handle right there. You know, it's a little bit heavier, I think, sometimes than that fiberglass handle. Uh, but it's uh, very durable, very useful, as long as you take care of these things. They do make these ergonomic tools, and that's what's pictured here. Now, I don't want you to think that this actually makes it the job easier. What these tools are doing is instead of putting that strain on the wrist, it's redistributing that effort to say your elbow or maybe your shoulder. So um, if, if you say maybe uh, you have issues with uh, fingers going down into your wrists, uh, pain, arthritis, anything like that, something like this translates that load, whatever, you know, whatever uh, strain you're putting on that part of your body, it translates higher up into your arm. Uh, but that doesn't translate to easier work. It just means your elbow or your shoulder is gonna get tired uh, uh, instead of maybe your wrist getting tired. And there are right and wrong ways to do your digging. So pictured here, uh, you can see uh, this gentleman here on the left side, he's away from the shovel, he's not standing over it. And this is putting uh, strain on uh, parts of his, his knee, his right hip there. 
better way to do this is to have as much weight as possible over top of your shoulder and push down on it. And, you know, I've really found, especially in hard, difficult soil to dig, um, one of the best things you could do is just rock that shovel back and forth. Um, I've dug in almost pure, you know, gravel dirt before, and it was very difficult, but I just rocked that shovel back and forth and it slowly moves its way down into the soil. And then you're able to uh, get a, a scoop of it. And a sharp blade is also incredibly useful. You can set out flags uh, to pace garden activities, whether this is for you, for volunteers, for program participants, set those flags out. And so when someone reaches the, the next flag, they know, hey, it's been say 15 minutes, it's time to do something different, or maybe it's time for a break. So come on over for a drink of water. So there are all types of gardens out there for special populations, different types of themed gardens. I do wanna point out one that I have worked with myself. This is at the Knox County Nursing Home. Um, so pictured here is an aerial photograph. This is actually off of their um, Alzheimer's uh, and memory care unit. Uh, here, there's actually a fence along the backside of the garden. Um, so as, as someone would navigate around this garden, you can notice the, the pathways and the, uh, what we have going on in here, different types of garden beds, uh, seating. So let's go down to there. So right in the middle there is actually a water feature, uh, has a little, little waterfall, little fountain, some goldfish in there. Uh, you can see there is a fence around it. Uh, and this is just to keep residents there from uh, accidentally falling into the pond. Uh, the, but even still, they have a rock that's going up a little bit higher than the gravel. So should someone say maybe a, a kid might be visiting, uh, you know, uh, a relative here, you know, they don't accidentally, you know, fall in there. Um, but this is, this is that water feature that's able to, uh, as I said, water and fire, those are the things that seem to hold the attention for humans. Uh, that's just something very pleasing to our brains about this. So uh, just being the main decorative feature for that garden, and this is what the whole garden is uh, centered upon. So there's pathways going around this and kind of uh, shooting off into other seating areas right here. So areas where you can rest in the shade. Um, it, there's another little water fountain where people can sit here and maybe watch uh, birds, the bird bath. The other thing though, also in here is the incorporation of color. There's different colors, there's different textures, uh, there's different uh, shapes and forms to these plants. And so this is, a, a, you know, for the senses, this is incredibly engaging for us. And they even still have that little water feature right there, a little bird bath there in the middle and a bird, little bird box. So um, it, for some, you know, you might look at this and say, oh, this is uh, too much color. Maybe it's uh, to the point of being gaudy, but um, from, the, from a sensory level, this is, I mean, there's a lot to look at here. Um, so it's very engaging to, to the residents. And so, you know, that's one of the things our master gardeners who work on this project, you know, they really do work uh, diligently to make sure that they have good pops of color throughout this garden. You know, there's, uh, you know, right here, these different uh, combinations. So maybe, yeah, it looks a little busy, but I mean, look at this, you know, you have your purple and your yellow and these, these mass plantings and sunflowers, rutabecchia in there, liatris. So, um, these different pops of color, which are very pleasing to the eye and enjoyable. And now actually out just on the other side, uh, outside the gate there actually is their uh, raised bed gardens. And so these are these, uh, uh, these taller, these high raised bed gardens that we mentioned at the beginning of the program, which you can roll up uh, with a wheelchair and you can uh, grow plants, residents grow, grow their own gardens here. It's incredibly rewarding uh, experience uh, for them and also for our volunteers that work here. Uh, and our volunteers say they actually learn so much from uh, working with residents here uh, that it, it, you know, this is just, it's the, one of their favorite projects. So, you know, in terms of design principles, when we look at these types of gardens, we're looking at these naturally mapped environments. So those pathways, they, they all connected back to each other. Um, and so everything kind of went uh, connected back into that central area of the, the, uh, of the building. And so, yeah, even though one path might go out, it actually would circle back into the interior. So um, it's kind of, it almost plays on that uh, Japanese garden design movement of uh, exploration, but it all has a, a, a journey that kind of brings you back into the center. Um, it, 
the gardens also give you a little preview of the layout before you enter that, that area. So um, thinking of patients that, that might have some Alzheimer's, dementia, anything like that, it gives them a, a preview of where they're going so it's not as foreboding and not as um, intimidating to go out there. Um, the pathways, are, as you saw, were concrete, they're smooth, they're, they're, they form loops, there's no confusing dead ends. Uh, the only dead end that I know of was that little seating area. Um, you know, so there's not just like the walkway just doesn't stop because uh, that can become confusing. And so it, it, it ended in that one point with a function or with a purpose. It's for uh, seating and for relaxing. Uh, those covered structures, the koi pond, the, some of the more ornamental type shrubs, those are landmarks that people remember as they move through the garden. You have seating for people to sit and enjoy that garden area. Uh, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, the, that Knox community or that Knox uh, County uh, Nursing Home Garden, they do a lot of older variety type of plantings. This evokes memory. Uh, this can uh, bring uh, memory back to some people and, and helps inspire, um, you know, some, maybe conversation with others and gets them interacting together socially. And, you know, again, that sensory stimulation. Uh, color, texture, all of that stuff can come together to help uh, just, just uh, engage residents, engage an audience, whoever it is you might be working with. Uh, you know, and Extension, we utilize, we're, we're throughout uh, Illinois uh, doing different types of uh, gardens, and whether it's a nursing home, a community center, um, you know, they're throughout the state. And this is actually, this, might, this is kind of an older list here, I'm sure there are others and there's more that I just have missed. Um, so apologize if I did miss that, but there's probably something happening in your neck of the woods for in terms of therapy. That's, that's me a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> I've had more kids and I have more gray hair now. So um, than when I did there, uh, if you want to view this or past recordings, we are on the University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that and you'll get notified every time we post uh, one of these videos or other uh, gardening horticulture related videos. Uh, and if say you would like to uh, give any feedback, uh, you can go to this web link, go.illinois.edu slash adaptive gardening for feedback, scan that QR code. Uh, and I'll take you there, but otherwise happy for any questions that may have come in or anything I can help out with.